Well, this isn't going to be a devotional. <laughs> I think of a devotional kind of as a short uh, time of uh, meditation on some practical principle in God's Word. This is just going to be a Bible study. Uh, but I hope it's going to be encouraging and helpful. And it may not be, and that, that's okay because it may not be something that uh, turns your gears. I don't know. But it's really something that I find to be fascinating. So in the, this morning's lesson, we talked about the Old Testament prophets prophesying promises and predictions from uh, God in the Old Testament and they not fully understanding all that's implied or what all is being said there and wondering how these things will be fulfilled or what really is the meaning of many of them. And so it showed that there was a, a spirit behind that, uh, the Holy Spirit, obviously, inspiring the writings of these prophets. And there was a message there that they didn't even know uh, all about. And so that was a, a kind of a proof of inspiration, isn't it? I mean, it's not something that these men conjured up in their own minds. Uh, and so Peter alludes to that and says, you know, the spirit of Christ was in them prophesying and predicting uh, the, the, the sufferings of Christ and the glory that would follow. And they really desired to know more about it. And it's a salvation, come to find out. It's a salvation that was worked by Jesus of Nazareth. And now we are recipients of it, uh, Christians. Uh, and so I, I mentioned this morning that we was going to look at, it, at an example of the prophets doing this very thing. Uh, and this is one of the most fascinating ap apologetics, maybe, where you can show evidences that the, the Bible is God's word. It's not man's word. Uh, it's, it's, of course, God's word given to his prophets, his apostles, these men, to write it. But uh, there is a mind behind it. And so I want to look at some of this. And I want to start, uh, I mentioned I was going to talk about Daniel, who was a prophet in captivity, Babylonian captivity, and before we go to his book, I want us to look at a statement about the captivity where Israel was carried into Babylon. Uh, this would be back in 586 B.C., but let's look at 2 Chronicles chapter 36, and I want us to notice a couple of verses. And then if you, can, if, if, if you want to follow this, uh, I'm not, not going to get too tedious, but I am going to explain some of this stuff in a way that if you wanted to write these down and look at them later... And you'll see how it fits together so wonderfully well, uh, and, I, and, and, uh, and hopefully you'll see the excitement in it that, that I believe you will. So 2 Chronicles chapter 36 is the last chapter of 2 Chronicles, and it records this final deportation where Nebuchadnezzar, has the king of Babylon, has come to Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, killed a whole lot of people. The ones that are left, he takes captive. These, this is that dispersion we talked about that Peter alluded to, the dispersion. In 2 Chronicles 36, verse uh, 19, for example, says they burned the house of God. They broke down the walls of Jerusalem. They burned all its palaces with fire. They destroyed all its precious possessions. And those who escaped from the sword, he, that is the king of Babylon, carried away to Babylon where they where they became servants to him and his sons until the rule of the kingdom of Persia. Now, this was when Daniel was taken. Uh, or Actually, Daniel was during this, this period. He was taken actually a few years before this, but he would be one that served in the palace courts of Nebuchadnezzar early on. And so Daniel was one who escaped the sword, but he was carried to Babylon, Babylonian captivity. Now, verse 21 says... To fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. As long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. Now we're going to look at Jeremiah in a moment, but Jeremiah predicts that Babylon is going to carry you into captivity to Babylon for 70 years. So Daniel writes this, he makes this prediction, and that's what's being alluded to here. But what, what I want us to note, it says that it was to fulfill the word of the Lord until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. As long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath. What in the world are they talking about there? Well, we are all familiar with Sabbath day, right? The seventh day of the week. But there was also what would be called a sabbatical year, 
a Sabbath year. And this was found in Leviticus 25, verses 1 through 7, that says, you know, when you come into the land, you can till the ground and plant your crops and harvest your food for six years. But the seventh year, you let it lie dormant. And that will be a Sabbath year. So all year, no planting, no harvesting, no nothing. So you have to kind of gather extra the year before, right? So you can survive. And not many people are very familiar with that law, but that's the sabbatical year law. And so Israel was to do that. Now the question is, did Israel do that? We don't have any record of, of that being recorded in the Old Testament. And many Bible students believe that that's a, this is an allusion to that law that says God punished Israel, among, for, among other reasons, for failing to keep this sabbatical year. And it accumulated up to 70 Sabbath years that they had neglected. Are you with me? As it says here, he carried them away so the land could lie at rest until it was fulfilled 70 years that they owed God. Now, if you're with me, you'll come to, to realize now that that, seven, that seventh year was one of those years, and then you go another seven years, that's another Sabbath year, another seven years, until you have 70 years. Well, how many years total is that? 490 years that they had this law that they didn't keep it. And so God said, you owe me 70 years of Sabbath rests, and I'm going to take them now. I'm going to carry you into captivity, and the land is going to lie dormant for 70 years to make up for all the years that you failed to keep my Sabbath year. Quite an amazing thing, isn't it? Now, there's more to it. We turn quickly to Jeremiah chapter 20. Uh, is it 6? No, Jeremiah 29. So Jeremiah 25 and 29 are very similar in that they both predict, Jeremiah predict, predicting 70 years of captivity. But notice Jeremiah 29, beginning in verse 1. He says, these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the remainder of the elders who were carried away captive to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. And it goes on to give more of that time frame. So he's going to now include the words of this letter that Jeremiah wrote while he was, of course, in <coughs> Judah, in Palestine, but he sent it to the captives in Babylon. And so the contents of the letter is the rest of chapter 29. But notice chapter 29, verse, uh, for example, verse 10. For thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you and cause you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me, and you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found for you, found by you, says the Lord. I will bring you back from your captivity. Now that's, a, that's a nice message there, isn't it, finally? You're thinking of all of the destruction and all the suffering for so many years, and God says, but I'm going to bring you back. After 70 years, I'm going to bring you back. Well, we turn now to Daniel chapter 9. One of the prophets that was a recipient of this letter of Jeremiah was Daniel. In Daniel chapter 9, we read, In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Now this is fascinating to me because Daniel is having a Bible study. <laughs> He's reading the scriptures. And when it says, I understood by the books, in the Septuagint translation, that word is biblia. That is to say, 
He's reading and understanding by the Bible, so to speak. That's where we get our word for Bible. But it says there were a number of years that were specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah that he would accomplish 70 years. So Daniel, seeing what this prophet said and reading the very same letter we just read out of Jeremiah 29, that God says after 70 years, I'm going to bring you back. And I'm going to, I have plans for peace and your prosperity and you're going to call on my name. I'm going to listen to you. I have great plans for you. You're going to search for me and you're going to find me. And then things are going to be restored, right? That's the idea. That's the good news and the promise. So Daniel just reads Jeremiah and says, and then he looks at the calendar and he pulls up his iPhone and he says, wait, we've been here for 70 years. He knows, doesn't he? He knows when he went over there in 606. And now it's 536. And he's saying, it's time to go home. And what did Jeremiah say? You turn and you pray to God. And it says in Daniel 9, verse 2, uh, verse 3, Then I set my face toward the Lord God to make request by prayer and supplication with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession, and I said. And he then enters into this long prayer that lasts for several verses, confessing the sins of his people, begging for God's mercy and forgiveness, and telling the Lord to bring us home now so that you can fulfill your great promises. To me, that's a fascinating thought of what's going on over there. Daniel trusts the word of the Lord through the prophets. Daniel reads the Bible. He understands these things, and now he's acting in accordance with it. And so he ends his prayer about verse 19 that says, O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, listen and act. Do not delay for your own sake, my God, for your city, your people are called by your name. So that's the end of his prayer. And the rest of the story is this, that Daniel himself now receives a revelation. The next verse 20, 20 says, Now while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in a vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening sacrifice, and he informed me. He talked with me, and he said, O oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. At the beginning of your supplications, and a command went out, and I have come to tell you, because you are greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision and then follows one of the most amazing prophecies of all the Old Testament. So Daniel is now receiving further prophecy about God's great promises that he has in store for his people. Now, it's not fully revealed. It's still a little bit clouded, and Daniel is still an Old Testament prophet. But, of course, by the time you get to the New Testament and you see how Jesus died and was raised, and then he begins to explain he is the fulfillment of all of these things. He began to be able to go back and, and find out more precisely what Daniel is talking about. Now, here's where uh, the, the lesson can get very tedious, and I'm not going to do that, uh, but I just want to give you the idea, just give you kind of an overview of, of what we're talking about here, because as you can see here, Daniel receives this message directly from the mouth of Gabriel. Verse 24, it says, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. Now, what's so significant about 70 weeks? If you have a, if you have a footnote, you will see that the word weeks is a Hebrew word that simply means seven. And that's the word for week, or it's also the word for the number seven. So in Hebrew, you would call a week a seven. Okay, you would call a week a seven. Don't get lost on the chart behind me, by the way, yet, because that's I don't want it to be confusing. So it's seventy sevens or seventy weeks. Now, of course, if we're just talking about weeks like we know, week seven days, we're only talking about forty-nine days, right? 
Um, but, I mean, 490 days, right? 70 weeks, 490 days. But remember that what Daniel was reading in Jeremiah was a fulfillment of God exacting the Sabbath years 490 years into the past. And now it's been fulfilled. What you have here is Daniel receiving prophecy about 490 years into the future and how God is going to fulfill his plan to, as it says, finish the transgression. This is in the middle of verse 24, which I believe has to do with what the next phrase, making an end of sin. In other words, we're going to bring in atonement, right? Make reconciliation for iniquity to bring in everlasting righteousness. Perhaps this is an everlasting covenant, right? To seal up vision and prophecy to anoint the most holy. So again, this is a, a specific framework for interpreting Daniel chapter 9, but it is, of course, in harmony with what we know the New Testament has to say about these subjects, and so I'm not putting this out as if to say there's no possibility that this could be uh, improved or better understood, perhaps, but it is a way. It is a way to bring it out. And so what I would like to show you is, is again, just a very quick overview of this. Daniel lived, this was in 536, maybe 538, but about 536 or so, and this was when it says the command went out, Many people believe this is probably connected to the decree of Cyrus, where he did command that the Jews can now return back to their homeland. And by a couple of years later, they had come back and built the foundation of the temple, as you read about in Ezra, chapters 1 through 6. But nonetheless, uh, as you see on the chart here, I have a very quick overview of 70 weeks of Daniel. So that should say 77's at the top, which would be, if we're talking about the same time frame, 70 Sabbath years, so to speak, would be 490 years into Israel's future from 536. Um, when, the, when the command goes forth, this is where I know it's going to get too tedious, but let me just give you the overview. So he gives further information in verses 25 through 27, the rest of the chapter here. And that's what's represented on this chart. Again, this is a way to understand it. I don't pretend to say there's no mistakes or that, I, you know, that things could be improved. But the point of it is this, that from the time that Daniel begins this 70-week prediction, what you have is the time frame to the cross. And so the cross being right here, we know, of course, that would be the year A.D. 30 when Jesus would have been crucified. And so there is one week that's mentioned in verse 27. that says, uh, He shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. So, in the time of Jesus, there's a seven-year period that Daniel is prophesying of here. But it says, the next phrase says, but in the middle of that week, he will bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And so I believe that the plausible understanding is in the middle of that seven years is when Jesus was crucified. And so if, he, if it was A.D. 30 when he was crucified, you just go back three and a half years when he began his ministry would be A.D. 26, the fall of A.D. 26. And that would be his baptism in John's baptism to begin his ministry. Three and a half years later would be Passover of A.D. 30 when he was crucified and resurrected three days later. And then that only gets us, that only leaves us to understand what is meant by the next three and a half years. And here is where different difficulties come into play. But I believe the most plausible thing is to see in the book of Acts when Stephen stands before the Sanhedrin in Acts chapter 7 and gives them one last chance to repent. And what do they do with him? They gnash their teeth at him and they rush upon him and they drag him outside the city and they stone him dead with stones. 
And then the very next verse in chapter 8, verse 1 says, they were all scattered from Jerusalem. And they all went out everywhere preaching the word. So I think this is that dispersion, so to speak, of a New Testament kind where Christians now are not confined to the city of Jerusalem where the infant church was for three and a half years, but now they have gone out to spread the gospel throughout the world. This would be in the year A.D. 33, three and a half years after the crucifixion and resurrection. And if you remember, the next couple of events in the book of Acts are what? The conversion of Saul of Tarsus, who is the apostle to the nations, and then in Acts 10, the first converts from the nation, the household of Cornelius, from the nations, the household of Cornelius. Again, that's just my interpretation of it. But even if you step back and you say, listen, I may not know how to make sense of all the details of this. Isn't it amazing to see that these prophets were delivering promises and predictions about a blessing that God wanted to bring to his people and they didn't, they didn't know exactly all that was entailed in it because they weren't the ones doing it. God is the one who was orchestrating human affairs, orchestrating human history to culminate in the birth of his son in order for him to stand trial and be convicted as a criminal and to use that unjust murder as the atonement sacrifice for sin. And then give him life three days later in order to loose the bonds of death. And now that message is carried, and 2,000 years later, we are recipients of it. And um, the prophets didn't always know how this was going to work out. It's another interesting study to, to read how they, how they did try to un understand and interpret many of these Old Testament prophecies, especially as you get into the later prophets where... <clears throat> Like Daniel, you know, getting more and more specific. But Isaiah was a messianic prophet. And he would talk about the, the servant of the Lord who would come. And sometimes the, the picture of the servant of the Lord was glorious. And, and uh, he ruled. And, and the, the land was uh, prospering. It was like the Garden of Eden again. And it was just a, a, a whole new heavens and a new earth kind of. A, a, that's the phraseology Isaiah uses. And then other predictions of the servant of the Lord was uh, he's going to be bruised. He's going to be beaten to a pulp and he's going to be rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And so the Jewish interpretation was, I can't figure out what's going on here. We know the coming king is going to be powerful like David and Solomon, but why do I now read about suffering and this terrible stigma of sin and all of this stuff? And this also enlightens us as to how, you remember Philip being told to go join the chariot where... <laughs> The eunuch was reading the prophet Isaiah, and the place that he was reading was Isaiah 53. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and, and so forth. And what was the question? Who, who is he talking about? Is the prophet talking about himself, or is he talking about some other person? What's interesting is that those were some of the interpretations in Judaism, that Isaiah was the servant of the Lord, other interpretations was there were two messiahs, a suffering one and a reigning one, and various other interpretations in between. But it was Jesus, of course. It's easy for us to see now. We look back in hindsight and we read what Jesus even said after his death, burial, and resurrection when he said, uh, this is exactly what I had to do because it was necessary that everything written about me in the law and the Psalms and the prophets must be fulfilled. That the Christ or Messiah must suffer, be raised from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name, beginning at Jerusalem. Uh, and so, you know, this is uh, something I think is behind Peter's statement in 1 Peter 1, 10 through 12 that says, you know, of this great salvation, the prophets have inquired, searched diligently, searching with intensity what time, what manner of time, what kind of historic movement God was going to work when it foretold the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. And to them it was revealed that not unto themselves were they ministering these things, but unto us. Things that now have been 
delivered to you by those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent down from heaven. Things which even angels desire to look into. So I hope that in some way this gives us a renewed appreciation, not that we don't already have one, but a renewed appreciation for the great work and purpose of God in the world and that he, his uh, purposes and plans will not be thwarted. They will most certainly be fulfilled. And he will come again one day to judge the living and the dead. And he will deliver his people from the destruction to come because of the salvation that he has offered in Jesus Christ. Thank you guys so much for your attention this afternoon. We're going to sing a song and have a final prayer before we're dismissed for the rest of the day. Thank you guys.